Hello and welcome to another cross-examine episode. In this episode, I want to continue in our little disjointed mini-series on the unpopular teachings from Jesus. Today, I want to look at the unforgivable sin. Now, if you've grown up in the church, you may be familiar with this term. Uh, but what I found is that few have actually spent time examining what this means and explaining it to their congregations. I remember growing up and hearing about the unforgivable sin and that it was blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, but I had no idea what that meant. Uh, so I spent a decent amount of time of my childhood and upbringing living in fear, um, wanting to ensure that I did not commit this unforgivable sin. I don't know if you felt that way the first time you heard about the unforgivable sin, but I just, I just remember entering into this mild state of paranoia, overthinking every thought and action and asking myself, like, was that it? Did I just commit the unforgivable sin? And as much as we may joke around about the issue <laughs> or think back to paranoia-filled childhood thoughts, this is a very serious issue and it's worth our time and attention. So I want to take time to dig into this teaching from Jesus and hopefully uncover the true meaning of it so that we can replace paranoia with a proper sense of fear and respect for God. Uh, the teaching on the unforgivable sin comes um, in Matthew 12 verse 31, but we're going to work our way up to that verse so that we have a proper context and understanding heading into it. So let's set the stage. So at the beginning of chapter 12, we see that Jesus is wandering through the grain fields on the Sabbath with his disciples and they were hungry. So they pick a little bit of grain and they begin to eat it. And the Pharisees, who always had one eye on Jesus, were following him uh, and criticized them for breaking Sabbath tradition. Now, for context, the Pharisees were the religious leaders and scholars in Israel. And they were strict adherents, not only to God's law, but to the, any religious tradition that they invented. And so here, they're citing the law of the Sabbath, which Jews were commanded to rest on. But they're elevating their own invented traditions above God's command. So God commanded the Israelites to rest on the Sabbath. Take a break from your job. Take a break from your normal day-to-day -day commitments to God. But the Pharisees added to this command from God and basically made it so that if you did anything except for walk to the synagogue, worship God, and walk back home, you were in violation of this law. So you couldn't just go for a leisurely stroll on the Sabbath because that was considered unnecessary work for your body. And here, in the case of the disciples, you couldn't work the grain fields because you were supposed to have done that prior to the Sabbath. It's your fault if you haven't prepared. I used to have this in my life growing up where we, would, we couldn't even fill our cars with gas because we were supposed to do that before the Sabbath. No work, no play, just go to church worship, go home. So if you put gas in your car or you buy pizza for youth group, that was considered a violation of the Sabbath. And Jesus' response to them is not to dismiss the Sabbath altogether. The Sabbath is still of great importance to God. What Jesus does instead is challenge the Pharisees' interpretation of the Sabbath law. He points out that the Pharisees themselves work on the Sabbath, and yet they are not in violation of the law. And he ends by saying that he is Lord of the Sabbath. So if he is allowing his disciples to gather food, he has the authority to do that. So in this chapter, we see strike one against the Pharisees. And after this interaction, Jesus enters the synagogue and comes across a man with a withered hand. The Pharisees are hoping to catch Jesus off guard and they want to accuse him of breaking the law. So they ask him, is it permitted to heal on the Sabbath? So clearly, Jesus' initial answer of, I am the Lord of the Sabbath, wasn't enough for them. That was strike one, and we are very close to strike number two for the, for the Pharisees. Jesus' response to their question of healing on the Sabbath is to ask which one of them would not save one of their sheep if it fell into a ditch on the Sabbath. Jesus presents these scenarios because they happened all the time, and the Pharisees held others to a higher standard than themselves. If they saw someone else pulling livestock out of the ditch, they would belabor that person with accusations. Why are you walking with livestock on the Sabbath to begin with? Don't you know that you're working when you exert strength to pull it out of the ditch and therefore you're violating the Sabbath? But if it came to them and their sheep and it fell into a ditch, they would just use the excuse of, well, uh, of course I can get it. I'm helping, not working. I need to do this for God. 
So Jesus offers this response and says that it is good for man to do good on the Sabbath. If you're able to save a sheep from a ditch, how much more so are you able to help man who was of more value than an animal? This irritates the Pharisees, so they pull away and begin to conspire against Jesus. That's strike two. Jesus, knowing this, leaves the synagogue and is followed by a crowd of people who he begins to heal. And as he begins to heal them, he tells them not to go and tell others, but to keep it to themselves. He wasn't doing this so that the Pharisees wouldn't find out. He was happy to heal on the Sabbath just like any other day. But if you read through Jesus' life, he often puts this disclaimer on his healing. He often tells people not to go around telling of their healing because he doesn't want that to be the main reason people come to him. If people only come to him because they can get healed of their physical issues... They're going to miss out on the real healing that they need. And that's their relationship with God. Jesus is not a hospital. So in the midst of Jesus healing these people, a demon-possessed man comes to him and Jesus heals him. The demon is removed and the people are amazed. But the Pharisees, who again always have one eye on Jesus, heard about it and accused Jesus of working under demonic power and influence. They say the only way he could cast out demons was by power of other demons. That's strike three. Jesus lays into them now. And this is where we see the mention of the unforgivable sin. Jesus first addresses this absurd accusation that he was either demon possessed or demon influenced. He says that a house divided against itself cannot stand. Why would a demon cast out another demon? It makes no sense. Demons work together. Why would one cast out another in the name of God? And Jesus points out that this makes no sense. And then we come to verse 30, and this is key to understanding the unforgivable sin in verse 31. In verse 30, Jesus says, Whoever is not with me is against me. Whoever does not gather with me scatters. Remember that. It's a short verse, but again, it's key to understanding what comes next. In verses 31 and 32, we hear Jesus say the following, Therefore, I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven but the blasphemy against the spirit will not be forgiven. And whoever speaks a word against the son of man will be forgiven. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven either in this age or the age to come. All right. So there it is. I went through the chapter leading up to this point because it helps inform why Jesus says this. He has these continual interactions with the Pharisees over and over again. He reveals truth to them and tears down lies and they reject it. He corrects their understanding of the working of the Sabbath. They get pissed, walk away. He corrects their understanding of healing on the Sabbath. They get pissed, they walk away. He names himself as Lord of the Sabbath. They reject him. He heals a man of demon possession. They accuse him of being demon possessed himself. There is a constant pattern of Jesus offering truth and the truth being rejected. And not only is the truth rejected in this passage, it's twisted into a lie. Not only is Jesus not the son of God, they say, but he's working with the devil. And that is what helps us unpack the meaning of the unforgivable sin. Note here that Jesus says other sins will be forgiven. Even other blasphemy. We have many examples of horrible sins in the Bible that are forgiven. David's murder and adultery, Paul's persecution of Christians, Peter's denial of Christ, and so much more. All of those horrible sins are forgiven. Jesus even says that blasphemy against him will be forgiven. There were many who rejected Jesus in Israel. They saw his works, heard his word, and they didn't believe but upon his death and resurrection, some did believe and they were forgiven. But Jesus says that whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. Here's what that means. Jesus gives us in this chapter an example of what the Holy Spirit does for us. In this chapter, like we've said previously, there is a continual pattern of truth being displayed and some believe, but others reject. A little while later, truth is displayed. Some believe, some reject. A little while later, truth is displayed. Some believe and some reject. It is this continual rejection of truth that is a rejection of the Holy Spirit and his work. 1 Corinthians 2.10 says that the Holy Spirit reveals to us the things of God. So if we are having things of God revealed to us, his identity, his work, his power, his attributes, and we reject that and continually reject that and speak against it, 
That is the unforgivable sin. Here, Jesus is warning that the Pharisees are in danger of committing this sin. They are trying to explain it away by saying Jesus is demonic. That's speaking against the Holy Spirit. In our day and age, we have people speaking against Jesus by saying, nah, he was a man, or he was a prophet, or he was a really good role model. Friends, I'm telling you this because I love you. If that is your view of Jesus, you are in danger of committing this sin. To speak anything of God that is not of God, like he's not eternal, he's not good, he's not holy, he's not just, he's not who he says he is, he's demonic, it puts ourselves in the realm of this sin. We are given time to repent and be brought into the arms of a savior. But if we spend our lives rejecting the truth that God's spirit reveals to us, we won't be forgiven. We will be consigned to the judgment that we have chosen for ourselves. We've seen God's truth. Romans 1.20 says that whether we've heard the gospel or not, we are without excuse because God's attributes are clearly perceived in the world. And so if you're in fear of committing the unforgivable sin, I want to offer some comfort to you. If you have this fear that you did commit or that you might commit this sin, then you haven't committed it. To commit this sin is to reject God continually. So if you're thinking, oh man, is this, is this, something, that I've got, if this, is this something that I've done? God, please forgive me. Then you are showing that you are not rejecting God and that you aren't guilty of this sin. Other sins can be forgiven, as Jesus said in this passage, but don't make the mistake, the eternal mistake of continually rejecting the truth of the Holy Spirit. Continue to turn your heart toward him and claim him as Lord of your life and you will be forgiven. And so I hope this is informative. I hope this dissipates some anxiety or fear and replaces that with a proper and rightful understanding of and fear of God and his word. But hey, maybe you disagree. Maybe I missed it. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm not fully understanding uh, what's going on here in this passage. Uh, reach out, share your thoughts. I'd love to know what you think, whether you agree or disagree, uh, what I might be over-referencing or under-emphasizing or missing entirely. I'd love to hear from you and we can keep the conversation going. So thank you, as always, for tuning in. May God bless you and I will see you soon.